Hello, everyone. You are tuned into today's PIR live event with Dr. Alex Fairwarren, a professor of computer science and leader of the Network Centric Applied Research Team, or NCART, at Ryerson University. My name is Anne, and today Dr. Fairwarren will tell us about his exciting research with rescue dogs and robots that aims to save uh, lives and improve rescue times and outcomes in disaster situations. Sounds like very cool research. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to welcome all of our viewers on the live stream. It's great to have you all with us today. Um, for those watching the live stream, remember that you can tweet your questions using hashtag AskPIR to, uh, to us throughout the live event. And if there's room, include your name or your city so that I can give you a shout out as well. I look forward to getting to some of those questions in just a moment. But first, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fairborn. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Anne. Um, I guess I should start by saying a bit about what we do. Um, so the research area is somewhat new for computer science. We call it computational public safety. Uh, we tend to focus on disasters or urban disasters. So um, it's not hard to imagine an urban disaster. Essentially, that's a bunch of buildings falling down all at once. Um, now, uh, a normal emergency is when the local firefighters and police and uh, um, medical staff can, can deal with that situation. But it becomes a disaster when it's beyond their capability to do that, and that's when we start to get interested. And uh, so what, what these emergency organizations do is called response. They respond to this emergency, which becomes a disaster, and they try and save people. And uh, what we do is we develop technology that tries to help them find people faster within the rubble of such a disaster. So that's what we do. And we Very tend to do it with dogs. Yeah, um, which is awesome. So um, one of the technologies you use, I see, is called canine augmentation technology. Uh, maybe you could tell us a bit more about that and how the rescue dogs and robots work together. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I guess a few years ago, maybe five, six years ago, uh, we had this strange notion that we could uh, uh, make walking robots. And uh, I'm not that great a roboticist. When I tried, it turned out that's a harder problem than I first thought. So I got together with a bunch of my students, and they realized, hey, you know, the easiest thing to make is something that we didn't have to make. We thought something that already walks, and that's a dog. Um, well, we don't. none of us had a dog, so we started looking around for dogs. Uh, so the first person, it took about six months, and the first person who had a viable dog, meaning not the crazy dogs that jump all over you, uh, but a dog is calm and able to do something for you, like carry a camera, was uh, this Ontario Provincial Police dog called Dare. And uh, Dare was such a calm dog, and he had a special skill that we didn't even know about. And his special skill was he could find people buried uh, in rubble through uh, smelling them, and, uh, and he could do it accurately every single time. And when he found somebody, he would bark. So we thought, well, some of the problems that the, the police that uh, follow this dog, they sometimes couldn't go into the rubble where the dog could go. Because if you've seen dogs run around, they're really good at it. And we're not anywhere near as fast or as agile as they can be. So the dog would run into the rubble and the cop couldn't follow. And the dog would start to bark, meaning he found somebody. And the cop would think, oh, well, that's great. He found somebody, but I have no idea where they are. So our uh, response to their response problem was to create a camera for the dog, and that was known as CAT, my, ironically, uh, canine augmentation technology. So we put uh, twin cameras on the sides of the dog, and uh, we let them film what the dog actually sees. So that was our first attempt. Um, we've been working ever since to sort of expand the effort. Now we have technologies that let the dog drop things off from the dog itself. So if you want to carry a radio with the dog, the, the, since the dog barks, we pick up that barking and uh, we let the dog control dropping off a radio to whatever victim they happen to find so that hopefully we can establish communication with somebody that's buried under the rubble. So we, we, kind of, we sort of follow along those lines with all the things that we do. So we don't help the dog at all. Actually, the dog's really good at what they do. Um, we just sort of help the people who are trying to understand what the dog is experiencing. Yeah. That's awesome. So the dogs can deploy a radio, but I understand they can also deploy maybe robots with cameras to um, sort of... Yeah, um, let me just see if I can actually find one that's here in the lab. Hey, uh, okay. do we have uh, decks lying around 
somewhere. Um, yeah, we have a small robot that we actually attach underneath a dog. So that, while one of my grad students is looking for an actual robot, we have this okay. fake, fake dog, which I bring into the scene. <laughs> and uh, uh, so the idea is dog doesn't have a lot of real estate to deal with. Uh, well, this one's kind of a fake Labrador retriever. Uh, what we do is we have this type of robot. So this is a robot we made in the lab. It's been 3D printed, so it's got its battery packs on the side. And if you look carefully at the front, it's got a little camera. And uh, what happens is we have a little bag, uh, strangely called the underdog, since it fits under the dog. And the dog will actually carry that into a rubble pile. And when it barks, the robot will fall off. The dog will run away, or not fall off the table. And then this, uh, this robot will stay with the victim. So we have sort of a two-way connection with the person. Now, this is actually really important because uh, now imagine yourself caught in rubble. So, you know, oh, man, building falls down on top of you, and you're lucky enough to survive. So you survive, and uh, then you're alone. So maybe it's a day later when they finally come and find you, and the first thing you see that actually is a friendly face is the dog. And it barks a lot. And then it unfortunately has to go away. So when it goes away, you're alone again. So how do you feel? So at least if the dog can leave a robot, the robot might have a light on it, and you can talk to the robot and they can hear you and may be able to talk back through a speaker, you realize somebody's coming for you. And uh, that would be a, a benefit to whoever happens to be trapped. Right? So, yeah. um, so there you go. That's the idea. Very reassuring. Does the robot do anything else while it's with the victim? Like, you know, other than maybe establish where the victim is and the surroundings? Does it do well, we have tried, we tried several different types of robots that could potentially be dropped off. I said the Dex is our homegrown version. Um, we have a, a, a snake robot. We combined efforts with a, a, a lab in a Carnegie Mellon University in the United States uh, where they develop snake robots. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the problem, so actually the benefit of the snake is it's very flexible. So uh, when it gets dropped off from the dog, it's able to wriggle around and it might be able to go closer to the victim than our, our dog is able to, or than our robot is able to. Now, the problem with the snake is it's got a lot of motors on it and it takes a lot of energy to run that. So it's tethered. So now imagine this, you have this free running dog that now has to drag in this snake with this giant tether in the back end uh, so the, the robot itself is not without weight. It weighed about seven or eight pounds. Uh, so we got this giant uh, German Shepherd called Freitag who could care less about this robot. Um, and it dragged uh, the, the snake and the tether uh, in about 50 meters into a tunnel system and dropped it off and didn't appear to even notice that it was carrying anything at all. So that uh, snake wriggled around and was able to go underneath the victim and actually send back video about the situation of what's underneath the victim as well, which can be very important as, as well. So there you go. So it, it, it's kind of up to your imagination what you could drop off. Um, so we, as I said, we made a small robot to show that it was possible and we demonstrated it in Texas and Ohio. Um, now it's up to somebody else to actually make more of them and more useful robots. So there you go. Yeah, so that sort of touches on one of the considerations um, when you're designing a robot for this purpose, um, you know, having it use up a lot of energy and having to be tethered. What other sorts of considerations are there when, you know, you're trying to design a robot that will fit on a dog and be able to maneuver in rubble? Um, well, there's a, there's a coin or a term we coined called dogernomics. If you heard of ergonomics, it's sort of making things for people that are, that are comfortable. Well, a dog will tell you quite quickly uh, when it's uncomfortable with something. So there's obviously an ob uh, a weight limit on what a dog can carry. So we've seen it usually it's below the 10 pound mark, probably less than five pounds, and it has to have a certain size. So it has to conform to the dog's shape. And dogs come in various shapes. So we, we discovered this research that, uh, uh, you know, there is no standardized mechanism for measuring a dog. Everybody seems to have all kinds of dog uh, lore, but very few numbers that actually go with that. So we were working with a, 
a professor in fashion in computer science. Uh, we don't do fashion, but we have fashion here at the university. Uh, and uh, she undertook the, the idea of creating canine apparel. So uh, we, we created a series of dog bras. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the uh, canine handlers tend to be male, and they have the sort of male attributes. Like they don't like this notion of bras being on their dogs. We had to change the terminology, but really we were putting bras on dogs and uh, they worked really well. Uh, so the robot kind of has to conform to the uh, the, the dog and uh, the, the apparel or the harnesses have to allow you to put the robots on the dog in that way. Now there's other issues as well. I mean, rubble is an unsafe environment, right? So if you ever see a construction site or a destruction site, so say when they pull down a building near your area, uh, they do it with the giant uh, cranes and backhoes and shovels. And the things that are exposed tend to be iron bars and concrete blocks. Now, those iron bars are called rebar, and they're extremely dangerous. And um, one of the things we were working uh, with first responders, emergency first responders and canine handlers for, was uh, assuring them that the dog won't get stuck. Because if you think about it, if the dog runs in there with an article of a canine apparel clothing and that dog gets stuck, you've just lost the dog. The dog, you can't rescue the dog because you can't follow the dog. So we uh, developed various schemes of uh, getting the, uh, the apparel to fall off so the harnesses will be magnetically linked or, or attached by Velcro uh, so that if the dog got stuck, Stuck, um, at least the, the equipment would be left behind the dog could escape. So eventually we uh, uh, got a certain amount of confidence in the canine handlers that uh, we were working with and they just let us put just about anything on a dog as long as the dog could actually carry it. Um, and they seem to have forgotten all about the safety issues for the dog but we continue to worry about that. So uh, we have a hope we're working now with a, a, a real professional canine um, apparel manufacturer who is designing a special harness that won't get stuck on anything and give us a lot more uh, ability to mount our cameras and other sensors on the dog. So there you go. Yeah, very cool. We have uh, our first question from Twitter. Um, Christine and her homeschool group want to know. Um, they've noticed uh, the green suit behind you and they, they want to know what the big green robot behind you is. That is actually a bomb suit. Um, let me put it closer. And let me this works. Uh, I'll point the various parts of it. So you see this this part here is the helmet, and that's a visor that you see. Would normally would be there. Um, so what happens is uh, uh, the, the specialty team we work with in the Ontario Provincial Police, they have two lines of specialization. One of them is uh, urban search and rescue, which I've just talked to you about. And the other one is called uh, CBRNE, uh, which probably you've never heard of, but it's chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear explosive uh, 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 team. And what they do is they worry about the nasty stuff that could explode and harm people. Um, and they try not, they, they definitely try not to get injured themselves. And one way to avoid getting injured when you're dealing with uh, an explosive device situation is to wear protective equipment. Now, uh, the bomb suit actually is uh, lined with Kevlar, uh, hard plastics, uh, various things that are not likely to uh, allow your injury. So it, it takes the blow for you if there's a bomb. Um, not to say that it would be a pleasant experience, because it would not, uh, but at least you have a better chance of survival. Now, the reason we have the bomb suit is uh, we want to mount sensors on the head of the bomb suit. Like if you look, it's very clumsy, right? So if you look at this thing, it's heavy, it's annoying. In fact, I punish my graduate students by making them wear it around the place. Um, so what we want to do is avoid the, the fine manipulation that uh, you would normally have happen with a bomb suit. Now, one of the things that uh, a bomb tech would have to do is move close to the device. And the way you disarm a bomb is a strange thing. You actually, one of the, you, you hopefully try and remove it completely from where it is, but if you can't remove it from where it is, you try and identify where the power supply is on the bomb, because inevitably it's electrical. And uh, so you kind of shoot a bolt of water uh, at the power supply, hoping to knock it off. Uh, now, like anything, any kind of, we actually have a gun that mounts on a robot. Uh, we actually have such a robot. I don't know if I can actually show it to you. So, you can see sort of the gray box on top. That's for the top. Um, 
this actually mounts something like a shotgun. Now, if anybody's ever shot a shotgun, you realize you've got to aim that thing pretty closely. Uh, well, of course, now you've got the shotgun mounted on a robot, and the robot has no idea how to aim. So what you do is you put a cop in uh, uh, one of these bomb suits, and you send him downrange, they call it, and he has to set up the robot and the shotgun and doesn't touch the bomb. It has to have exact measurements because you, you can only fire from a certain range. So what we're hoping is that by mounting a sort of three-dimensional sensor on the head of the bomb suit, the bomb tech can then just walk around the bomb scene and we can build a three-dimensional model of what it is and give them exact measurements. So instead of taking out your Canadian tire uh, scale of measure, your, your tape measure, uh, we can just give you an exact distance uh, based on a model that you can hopefully see in the visor of your bomb suit. And uh, so they do this, they set up the shot and then they fire at it. And if all goes well, the bomb is neutralized and all people are safe. Uh, and our technology hopefully will work. Have we ever done this? No, but it is cool watching stuff explode. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So has, um, have your robots ever been used in a real disaster situation or are you still testing those as well? We're testing them. Um, they, they were almost, one of, the, one of the devices we had was almost deployed to, uh, in 2010, 2010, there was an earthquake in Haiti and uh, the team we work with was scheduled to be deployed with uh, Toronto Heavy Urban Search and Rescue. Uh, so they were going to go to Haiti, and uh, my grad students were busily working on the uh, the prototype and turn it into a more ruggedized version so that uh, the team could actually take it with them. But uh, the Canadian response turned out to be just money, so the federal government sent uh, a disaster assistance response team, or DART, from the Canadian forces and a whole bunch of cash, and they never deployed any uh, civilian first responders, so it never went. But we've been on uh, various exercises. In fact, uh, I talked to you a little bit. We're going on an exercise size uh, on the 25th of this month to uh, Windsor. So we, the OPP have requested that uh, we bring our technology w with us uh, so that their canine teams can use it. Um, so we'll do a bunch of modeling for them and uh, hopefully find some people in rubble. So we know it works. Uh, we're in, actually, it's one of those things where you'd like to see it work in reality, but you kind of don't want to see it work in reality because, you know, if it's deployed, it's bad, right? So uh, we're kind of happy to be in the lab at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question going back to the robots again. You mentioned the materials that the bomb suit's made out of. What kinds of materials are the robots made out of? Um, I can actually show it to you. Chris, can you bring over some uh, printing material, a 3D printer spool? Just give me one of those. Yeah, give me some of that stuff. And one of the, the raw material as well. Yeah, he's coming over with it. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Do you think this stuff is uh, really high technology? Um, yeah, he's, so we'll show you some of the things we can print. Assuming he's like, uh, you better toss me some of those things. Here, just toss me one, one of the printed ones. Yeah, okay, so I'll show you what, what can be done. So here, this is actually a set of, uh, here, oh yeah, here. So this is like a sort of a test length. So what this is is a, kind of a... Uh, um, ball bearing system that we made and uh, a bunch of gears, a bunch of toys that kind of spin. But the real trick is uh, we can actually do three-dimensional models of, uh, oh yeah, here's a, we don't actually know what this is, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, but this is rubble. So this is actually huh? rubble that we modeled uh, in Texas. Um, it was a weird kind of rubble pile because this is actually a couch you can see on top. And uh, this is a culvert where uh, the dogs would actually enter in for our searching. So we, we made a three-dimensional model of that. And they saying, well, what is this made out of? Like, and a robot is made out of the same stuff. So Dex that I showed you before is made out of the same stuff as this. And this stuff is essentially a uh, whippersnipper. <laughs> like if you have a whippersnipper at home, um, it's not exactly the same plastic but essentially it's a spool of plastic and uh, the 3D printer uh, will take that and melt it over time and eject it, inject it into exact spots. Um, it's not exactly as perfect as uh, uh, having it manufactured. So this robot, if it was manufactured out of pure plastic bits, uh, might be waterproof. But uh, ours tend to be not waterproof because there's little dabs of plastic that are ejected, so that leaves little holes. So uh, the plastic that we inject tends to get waterlogged, we discovered. So uh, 
there won't be any boats that we make out of our uh, 3D printer. They tend to sink. But uh, as a prototyping material, it's quite useful. So um, the, the plastic's really cheap. We have uh, you know thousands of, uh, well, not one's a thousand. We have dozens of rolls of the stuff hanging around the lab in various colors. Uh, and of course, just like uh, Big Bang Theory, we have our bobbleheads lying around here somewhere as well. So. Uh, <laughs> That's go. really cool. So all the robots um, you've been working with so far have been 3D printed? No. Um, our first robots were made out of junk. Uh, I wish I could see one that was just lying around. Mm -hmm. Do we have a junk robot? Uh, give me one of those uh, robots over there. Uh, yeah, to the right. Yeah, that's anyone. Anyone will do. One that you can lift that probably won't fall apart. These tend to be kind of fragile. Um, so our first robots were, we were actually teaching an undergraduate course. If you came to Ryerson, you'd be building crap like this. <laughs> so this is actually a, a pseudo robot uh, that uh, there's its brain on top, actually wired by a... Uh, uh, I guess it was a third year student and there's its power supply and motor system and uh, it's got like golf golf pegs for uh, weapons and and uh, <laughs> it sees you with these eyes and yeah. it's made essentially out of wood uh, medium density fiber fiberboard over where is it over here that's a wooden wheel uh, these are bits of aluminum um, basically we found it now, most of the stuff is found. Um, students at Ryerson who take these courses, uh, they tend to carry around a shoebox full of junk, and uh, that junk slowly becomes a robot. And uh, what we try and teach them is not so much uh, what to do with the junk. They kind of figure that out for themselves, but we give them a notion of what you can do. So the, the, uh, the course is called Autonomous Mobile Systems, meaning we want to get the robot to do as much as it can alone without investing too much time, effort, or computation. So uh, uh, this changes the way students tend to think, and it helps us in the lab. So when they, they go from this monstrosity I just showed you to eventually make decks. So the student that made this thing was instrumental in making this thing, um, just mm. because of the way they think. So uh, that was sort of our philosophy of how we try and get students to think. Plus, we're cheap. We don't have a lot of cash, so this is a great way of working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, we have another question here, um, this one from Drew. Um, he wants to know, can the robots and dogs be used for things other than finding people in rubble? Uh, for example, could the dog drop off a robot that could be used to analyze the state of the rubble so that it doesn't collapse further when rescuing people? Yeah, um, actually, I can I can give you a, a search term you can look for on YouTube. We've tried this as well. Um, not so much dropping off a robot. Like a robot is only one way of looking at the world. So, so one way of uh, uh, one problem that first responders tend to have is there's no reliable communications in these rubble piles. So if you um, you search on YouTube and you look for uh, Canes, C-A-N-E-S, uh, Ryerson, and Fairwarn, uh, you'll, uh, so F-E-R-W-O-R-N, you'll probably find a video that shows you us dropping off um, repeaters, or uh, um, they're essentially Wi-Fi routers that uh, get dropped off from the robots. So they're not looking for anything. What they're actually doing is producing a radio signal. Now, if you have enough dogs drop off enough of these repeaters, they form something called a mesh network. So they mesh themselves together, and they know how to communicate with each other, despite the fact that they don't move. And uh, the beauty of this is it actually sets up a line of communication underneath rubble rather than just over top of rubble. So when, uh, uh, say, firefighters are looking for you, uh, if the dog manages to drop one of these things close to you, you should be able to actually tie onto it with something like your smartphone. Um, and if you're using your smartphone, we hopefully will be able to find you using that signal. So uh, there, there are lots of ways we, we're, we're continuing to experiment with this notion of finding people under rubble using only things that they have on them. And uh, the dog would be instrumental in dropping off something like that. So it wouldn't be a robot that's dropping off. It would be dropping off this mesh router. So, uh, yeah, we do it for, for many things. Uh, we, as I said, we also work for these CBRNE scary guys with bombs or trying to remove bombs. Uh, they have lots of uses for dogs that have nothing to do with finding you in rubble. Um, as you, if you've been in the airport, you'll see the dogs are sniffing at you. They have uh, search dogs. They are looking for uh, drugs mostly. 
but uh, some of those dogs are actually bomb dogs, meaning they will look for accelerants and explosives that you're also not allowed to have on you. And uh, those dogs actually sit. Uh, so where an, an Usar dog, a dog, the rubble dog, will bark, these ones actually sit and look directly at a device. Well, this is cool because since the dog stops, we have a much more stable platform. So we're, uh, we'd like to do many things. So we have other sensors that uh, uh, we would like to mount on the dog that's now stationary so we can sense kind of a, what the, what's going on with the explosive. Now, uh, we have some crazy ideas, right? So there's a, there's a sensor called uh, Near Infrared Brain Spectroscope. Uh, it's a physics sensor, and what it does is it measures the oxygenation and deoxygenation in your brain. Um, so it actually sends a small infrared signal, uh, light, into your skull, and it measures your capillaries expanding and contracting depending on how much oxygen is actually reaching your brain. And uh, there is a certain correlation between what that does and what you're thinking. So if you've seen those uh, things on functional uh, magnetic resonance imagery, FMRI, this is sort of a different type of the same kind of sensing. So what we want to do is actually attach these things onto dogs. So we actually have a, yes, another dog bra. Uh, it goes over the dog's head with this uh, near infrared brain spectroscope attached to it. And uh, we did some tests with bomb dogs uh, to see, because we have this idea that not only can the dog detect the explosive, but we believe the actual dog might actually know what the explosive is, but it can't tell you because all a dog can say is roof. Uh, so we think that uh, um, we might be able to actually, in a sense, kind of read what the dog is thinking um, in a broad way. So uh, so this is another another use for dogs that we have. That has nothing to do with dropping anything off, but with sensing from the dog. Right? So I don't know if I answered yeah. your question, but I do tend to ramble. Right? So. Yeah, no, that's so cool. And uh, thanks, Drew, for that question as well. Um, we have another question from Christine. Um, she's wondering, what was the biggest robot you've made? Um, the, the, we tend to make very small robots, mostly because of uh, uh, the, the size constraints and the money. The bigger you make them, the, the, the uh, more difficult they are to maintain because they just require more and larger items like motors and uh, different actuators. Uh, they become prohibitive. So uh, what we tend to use is we tend to reuse things. Uh, so we have a, a bunch of wheelchairs that we used. We had a project once called uh, the Network Enabled Power Wheelchair Adapter Kit, uh, NEPWAC. So it actually became quite an elaborate thing because it had a set of cameras on a traditional wheelchair, electric wheelchair. And the idea was that uh, we would actually have a sort of a web service on the wheelchair that allowed you to connect to a wheelchair and drive it around. Because we thought since we have an aging population, we thought it might be cool to have uh, sort of services available on the wheelchair for somebody who might be stuck in it, who can maybe talk to a doctor or a nurse uh, somewhere remote. And we thought this would be the greatest thing to slice bread. So that was the largest robot we ever worked with, which is slightly larger than a you know, wheelchair you could imagine. And people hated it. Um, the reason people hated it, I think, is because uh, uh, people don't like the idea of being in a wheelchair, with good reason. Uh, they also don't like people watching you in a wheelchair, and they certainly don't like the idea of someone taking control of that wheelchair. So uh, we were pretty much banned from a building of old people because we, we suggested this idea. So we stopped that line of research. <laughs> okay. So that was the biggest one. Yeah, thanks for that question, Christine. Um, we have a couple minutes left. Um, maybe to finish off the session, you could, uh, you know, talk about if somebody wanted to do your type of work, working with robots or in disaster situations or both, um, you know, what kind of advice do you have for them? What can they do to get there? Um, there's a number of ways you can enter this field. So um, uh, the, the people who are responsible for uh, dealing with urban disasters are essentially uh, first response organizations. So this is mostly firefighters and police. Uh, if you're interested in in, in working in, in terms of technology for this, there's a, a few places you can go. So there's a traditional engineering way of looking at the world. So uh, we have, in, at Ryerson, we have electrical engineering. So I have a colleague who's interested in mine safety. So he's uh, working on uh, systems for transmitting uh, data underground. 
uh, uh, using wireless networks. So this is actually uh, quite an interesting thing. So he's he's an electrical or computer engineer. Here in uh, the NCART lab in computer science, we are more interested on surface disasters. So we're interested in uh, uh, helping first responders. So you, the type of education you would need uh, would be uh, some, some background in computer science because basically all the gadgets we run um, have either, well, they we usually have both mechanical components and computational software that run on them to make things decisions. So a lot of things we do are uh, artificial vision systems, so things that interpret camera data and give us a signal when something uh, happens uh, so we can make decisions on it. So you would go into something like machine vision or robotics in computer science uh, so you could work in this area. Um, lots of places offer it. We tend to be in Canada virtually the only place that uh, uh, worries about uh, urban disasters. So uh, we we are a, we're the lab basically, and we work with the Ontario Provincial Police and uh, Toronto Heavy Urban Search and Rescue, which has been in the news when the Elliott Lake uh, disaster happened. Uh, they are the ones who responded to that. So uh, it's, none of our equipment went with them, um, but they said they might have been able to use it. But uh, uh, so that that's we have a, a probably eight or nine students now, graduate students, uh, and two or three undergraduate students um, in computer science and medical physics, strangely, because uh, we offer a program here, uh, an undergraduate program called medical physics. Uh, now, there we tend to try and save people, but we people don't like to be prodded that much and buried under rubble. So we're, we're trying to make fake people, so uh, basically devices that have the same temperature and uh, thermal characteristics uh, people so we can detect them uh, under objects and uh, so that's a medical area and the physicist works with us to do that uh, and these aren't graduate students or anything these are you know second year undergraduate students who are working on this as a project because they never thought that anybody would have a need of it and uh, we're crazy computer scientists and we need somebody else who knows about people um, so we work quite closely with them. So all told, we have about 15, maybe 16 students uh, spread out through the entire university, kind of worried about this stuff. So Ryerson has about 70, I would say, faculty members who have something to do with public safety. Uh, so this would be sort of the area to come, right? So, um, so the undergraduate, get yourself a math science background uh, and just remain curious, right? Yeah, that's awesome. So it sounds like Ryerson has some really neat programs for students to look into. That's cool. Yep, we'd like you to come. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's all the time we have for today's uh, Q&A with Dr. Farwar. And I'd like to thank all our live stream viewers for watching and everyone who we did in a question today. Thank you. And I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Fair Warren as well for joining us and sharing all his insights and advice. Thank you very much. And our dog, our dog Stuffy says goodbye too. Yes. And thank you to the Stuffy. <laughs> <laughs> Bye for now, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you.